by saying I don't fully understand what I'm talking about this morning. And you're probably sitting there thinking, that's nothing new. You never know what you're talking about. But uh, what we're talking about, the text, is one that uh, is hard to comprehend, much less explain. The verse is Luke 6.38. Jesus is talking. Let's read this together. Um, Luke 6.38. Give, and it will be given unto you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Thanks for reading with me. It wasn't there, was it? You probably agree that when it comes to money management, much of what God's Word teaches makes perfect sense. I mean, the Bible warns us against the danger of debt. says that the borrower is servant to the lender. If you've ever been under budget busting, consumer crushing, credit card debt, the bankruptcy kind of debt, you know that uh, you never want to go into debt again. Bible's advice on that is understandable. The book of Proverbs teaches us to save money. It says, uh, look at the ant. Saves for the winter. Stores up for the rainy day. And even people who aren't followers of Christ get the wisdom of that and save. But Jesus comes along and teaches us something that is counterintuitive. He says, give, and it will be given to you. With the measure you use, it will be measured to you. That's God's math for givers. And this new math for followers of Jesus goes against everything within us. We are natural born takers, not givers. We are born to get, not to give. And selfishness resides in our hearts. It's just not normal for us to give things away, especially our money. So we are dealing with one of the most difficult economic questions that we face as Christians. This brings us to one of the most basic things that we have to get right if we're going to manage our resources well. And here's the basic issue. Deep down, do I really trust God enough to give something away and depend on Him to more than resupply my needs? Do I trust God's math for givers? I made a decision to accept Jesus as my Lord and Savior when I was in fourth grade. And I'll never forget it. My dad was starting a church in Ottawa, Illinois. I met in a middle school gym. I had known for weeks that I should do this. I should confess Christ and be baptized. But I was hanging on to that folding chair in front of me every Sunday until the invitation hymn was over. And then one Sunday, my friends Peggy and Ray, sitting with me, decided, we're going to be baptized. And so they bumped me out in the aisle. And before I knew it, all three of us were up front there confessing our faith in Christ. And the next thing I knew, we were being driven to a church nearby that had a baptistry, and we were baptized that afternoon. And from that time on, my attitude has been, God, I will trust you until you prove you can't be trusted. Next big decision I had to make was, what am I going to do with my life? Our youth group used to go to Lincoln Christian College every summer for a big youth rally. They literally had thousands of students there. It was so big, they had to put up these big tents for it. And, and uh, every year, they'd have a high powered speaker challenge us students to dedicate our lives to full-time Christian service and the, to go into God's harvest field. And they would sing verse after verse after verse until everybody was out of the tent and up front. And one year, I was literally the only one from our church who didn't go forward. And it wasn't because I didn't want to dedicate my life to full-time Christian service. I just didn't know if I could do it. I already planned to go to Cincinnati Bible seminary, that's what it was called back then, but I just wasn't sure I could be a minister. My problem was a lot like the guy who was afraid to get married. He told his friends, I really love this girl I'm dating, but I don't know what I'd talk about with her at mealtimes for the rest of our life. All he could think about was awkward silence during meals for a lifetime. And my problem with full-time ministry was I knew preachers, or yeah, preachers have to talk. And I'm not that good at talking. I do not have the gift of gab. I could see myself failing as a minister because I didn't have anything to say. But I decided 
I'm going to trust God. See if he'll give me something to say. And he has for 44 years. And that's just one of the many ways down through the years that God's been trustworthy. Back in the 60s, my parents came to the North American Christian Convention in Detroit, Michigan. And they came back talking about what a beautiful place Detroit is. And they stayed with our relatives on Grosseo and they said, well, you just look out the window of their house and there's Canada over there. And Cobo Hall had just been built. It was state of the art. And they were just overwhelmed with that. And I thought, wow, I wish I could see Detroit. Sounds like a great place to live. Little did I know that God was preparing to send me there for the rest of my life. When I graduated from college, I sent out my resumes to several churches looking for youth ministers. And I'd never heard of this place called Livonia, Michigan. Didn't associate it with Detroit. But this place called Memorial Church of Christ needed a youth minister, and they had a, a letter there in my stack. Of course, I was hoping for one of the mega churches that I had applied to, like Southeast and uh, Southland and Kentucky, but uh, the Lord brought me here. And he knew I wasn't that crazy about youth ministry, so he even opened the door for me to preach after less than a year. And I could just go on and on with stories about how trustworthy God is. I've been a Christian for more than 50 years, so I've got a half century of experience to draw from. And you do not have time for me to just go down through the list of all the ways that I have found God to be trustworthy. All I can say is that when I started serving God, I vastly underestimated His trustworthy. Way underestimated his grace, his mercy, his faithfulness, his generosity, and his love. And I was excited back then about telling people about Jesus and preaching, and I wanted to let everybody know how wonderful the Bible is. And I still love to preach the Bible, but now it's personal. I put God's promises to the test. I can tell you, he's trustworthy. I'm here to tell anybody who will listen that God can be trusted. He has led me. He has provided for me for a lifetime. This message has been 66 years in the making. God can be trusted in every area. I've learned that when things are going great, God can be trusted. I've seen that when the future is bleak, God can be trusted. I've seen people go through times of heartbreak like I couldn't even imagine, grief. And I see in their life that God can be trusted. I can say unequivocally, you can trust God. And about now you're wondering, did you forget your topic, Mark? I thought we were here to talk about God's math. I haven't forgotten. Here's the most fundamental issue you must wrestle with when you read that promise in Luke 6.38 is trust. When God says give, and it will be given to you, the question is, can I trust Him? Do you believe that the God of the universe is capable of keeping that promise or not? Do you trust that Jesus is telling the truth when he says, for with the measure you use, it will be measured to you? When it comes to give, giving generously, the basic issue is what do you trust most in life? Is it God? Trust God to meet your needs? Or is it money? You think money will meet your needs. If you give away your money, and you believe money's going to meet your needs, how are your needs going to be met? But God tells us, trust Him. Just go, away, go ahead and give away your money. There are three kinds of giving that God expects every follower of His to do. They're, they start with the tithe. This is where we trust God with the first 10% of our income, earnings, gains, windfalls, right off the top, 10%. We obey the clear teaching of the Bible. We honor God with 10% of our income to the local church that we have become a part of. That number 10 is interesting. You know what the number 10 represents in the Bible? Testing. Think about it. How many times did 
God tests Pharaoh with plagues in Egypt. Ten. How many commandments are there? In other words, how many ways is our obedience to God tested? Ten. How many times did God test Israel when they were wandering in the wilderness? Ten. Jesus told this parable about ten virgins, Matthew 25. It was about preparedness for the arrival of the bridegroom. Revelation 2.10 mentions ten days of testing. And of course, how many disciples did Jesus have? Twelve, not ten. Just <laughs> seeing if you're paying attention. The number ten, though, is associated with testing throughout Scripture. And how much do we trust God? Enough to honor God with the first 10% of our income, the tithe? You see, that's a heart check for followers of Jesus. Tithing is taught in many places in the Bible. Malachi 3.10 is the most famous. This is where God says, bring the whole tithe. That means 10% of your earnings. Into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty. See if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing, you will not have room enough for it. Single mom living in Rockford, Illinois, was going through a tough time. Had a seven-year-old daughter. She had been unemployed. Her only income was an unemployment check. Trying to go to school and support her daughter. Couldn't have been any tighter. When she was challenged by a friend in her church, to put God to the test and give him the first 10%. Her friend urged her, you got to give God 10% of your check. You got to trust him to meet your needs. And that was scary, very scary. She had no security to fall back on. With fear and trembling, she wrote out that first check. It was $33. That was three years ago. What came next made her so excited she was willing to get up in front of her huge church and tell everybody, this works. She told her story about how for the last three years God had been remarkably meeting her needs. And she continued to honor God by giving 10% of her income and she finished school, she got a good job, she bought a little house, she and her daughter are doing fine. Here's the rest of the story. The week before she was scheduled to give that testimony about tithing in church on Sunday, her water heater went out and her car broke down and she had no idea how she was going to meet those unexpected expenses. Here she is scheduled to speak on Sunday about tithing and how God just blesses you so much when you give your 10% to Him and she's looking at a water heater and a car. Well, the mechanic in her church heard about the car and fixed that. A week before she was to give her testimony in church, she received two unexplained checks in the mail. One was for $220 from a hospital bill that she had overpaid two years before. She got another check for $50. It was a rebate. Guess how much her water heater cost? $269. That's God's math. Just a little bit more than needed. Sometimes God provides a mechanic to fix your car free. Sometimes He gives you income you didn't expect, but trust Him. There's a second kind of giving that God challenges His followers to do. Free will offerings. This is additional to your tithe. But sometimes the Holy Spirit just kind of whispers in your ear, you know, you really ought to help that cause. Or you really ought to help that person. Jeannie and I give our tithe to this church. We think we should do that because you are our church family. But there are other things that we feel led by the Holy Spirit to support as well. And one of those is IDES. It helps struggling people all over the world come back from disasters. And then there's Faith Promise, our missions program. We give over and above the tithe to that. Anytime one of our missionaries comes to speak, we take a love offering, and I wish I could hide the checkbook. On the way home from church, I'm afraid to ask my wife, how big was that check that you put in that love offering today? And like you, we get all these special appeals in the mail from brothers and sisters in Christ who are starting a church, or they're going on a mission trip, or they're organizing something to stamp out suffering of one kind or another, or Bible college is trying to build a building or keep the heat on. I mean, those are free will offerings over and above the tithe. 
And third, sometimes God calls us to give an extravagant sacrificial gift. I've noticed in my lifetime, looking at the lives of mature Christians that I greatly admire and respect, that it's not uncommon for God to ask His faithful followers to make a major sacrificial gift so big it scares them. Extravagant gifts are scary because the giver just has to trust God to provide this. It's been my experience watching people make these kinds of gifts and doing it myself that God usually more than resupplies what we give away. You see, that's God's gift or math for giving and receiving. Those who make extravagant sacrificial gifts grow in ways that they would grow under no other circumstances because they reach a level of maturity where they simply and absolutely say to God, I trust you. I'll obey. I told you at the outset that God's math isn't something that I fully grasp. And that's true, but it doesn't mean that I haven't experienced it. But to be honest, I'm reluctant to talk about God's math, how He generously outgives even the most extravagant givers, because I sometimes see Christian broadcasters and ministries abusing God's math, manipulating people. They use this to appeal to people's greed. And before you know it, God's math is more about personal prosperity than kingdom growth. Getting blessings back from God becomes the motive for giving rather than the reward for giving. We should give out of love and gratitude for a blood-stained cross. Nothing else. Even if there was no return without God's math, we should want to give out of sheer joy of giving for the generosity that God has poured out on us. Just a response, a reciprocation to that. I'm reluctant to talk too much about how God gives back to me with a bigger shovel than I'm giving to others. But the truth is, He does. I've experienced it over and over again in my life. I've seen others blessed by God in a big way when they have stepped out on faith and given more than they thought they could afford to give. Back in 1994, we decided we needed to expand our church building. We got Bob Porter to help us with some plans and we had a capital campaign and we were all challenged to give a major gift to the Lord and our giving would make it possible to about double the size of our building. At that time, I had two sons who would be heading to college soon. I had not saved enough to pay their college bills in advance, and I knew we had some major expenses coming to our family, but I'm the preacher, and I didn't see how I could encourage others to make a big donation to the building fund if I wasn't willing to do the same. So Jeannie and I stepped out in faith, and we gave that money that many would have said, you should have kept back to give to your boy's education. But I was happy to give to the Lord's work, and I was excited about the t potential for growth that this edition represented. And yet I was worried about how am I going to send my boys to college? I figured it out. Schoolcraft. That's the answer. My boys can live at home and take two years at schoolcraft, get half their college requirements before the big bills start to hit. But our older son was dead set on taking engineering at University of Detroit. Not cheap. We tried to talk him down to U of M or Dearborn. That would be a little, a lot cheaper. No, it's got to be U of D, Dad. Okay. Well, God put Joe Clark in a position of vice president of University of Detroit, and the next thing we knew, Ryan was in U of D, and we could afford it. He got his electrical engineering degree there, and he has done just fine. But then there was Rob. He was just three years younger, and how are we going to handle his school bills, especially that year of overlap there? And I started talking up Schoolcraft College. Rob, you know Schoolcraft is great, close to the house. It's a great place to go to school. No, Dad, I want to go out of state. Rob, 
You know, there's this thing called an in-state credit. Uh, that's, that's the ticket. You want to go to school, crap? Get that. You know, that's the thing. No, Dad, I want to go to Cincinnati Bible College. What? How could I refuse him going to my alma mater? My dad's alma mater? All right, I guess that will be okay, Rob. And with some help from this church, he was able to get through CCU, Cincinnati Christian University. Now, that's just one example from my life of God's math. When people made extravagant, sacrificial gifts to the building of this edition, I heard many people talking about how God was just incredibly blessing them. I heard people talking about how that they had, uh, this one guy in particular said, I based my commitment on overtime. I told God I will give him all the overtime that I make for the next three years. And he told me afterward, he never had so much overtime in all his life. <laughs> and as soon as his commitment stopped, so did the overtime. And he was ready for that. People got promotions. They started getting career boosts that exceeded their wildest dreams. God's math was on full display when we gave $1.2 million over and above our regular giving to the church in three years. Same thing happens at Faith Promise Time when people step out on faith to give to our missionaries as God gives to them. Stories start coming back of ways that God is blessing. God is far more creative and generous than we can possibly imagine. And those who step out on faith trusting Him to supply the means to send our missionaries with the Gospel see God going to work in their personal lives in ways they did not even imagine. That's God. International Disaster Emergency Services outgrew their building and their technology in this little town of Kempton, Indiana, where their headquarters was. The reason we were there is somebody gave us a building that was free. Being the chairman of the board, being frugal, when they wanted to move from that free building into this multi-million dollar building, I wasn't too excited about it. But it was clear that the Lord wanted Ides to move where the technology and more people were available to help us help disaster victims around the world. And I said, okay, I don't know where the money's going to come from, especially since you picked a site in Noblesville, Indiana, a very upscale neighborhood. You remember it wasn't that long ago when we talked about the moving. It was January 2014 when they moved into the new building. And we burned that mortgage months ago. That's God's math. I've been watching God work for more than 40 years. And I trust Him more now than I ever trusted Him before. I believe in the core of my heart that nobody outgives God. Trust God. I can't predict what He's going to do. 2 Corinthians 9, 6 says, Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will reap also sparingly, and whoever sows generously will reap also generously. Verse 11 says, You will be made rich in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion, and through us your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. And that's just a summary of what I've seen in my lifetime, in the Lord's service. The more people sow, the more they grow, the more they reap, they become even more generous. More opportunities to be generous come along. God allows them to have the means to be more generous for those. And the blessings of God just keep on flowing. And the generosity just keeps on growing until God receives this abundant thanksgiving and praise. I feel like the most blessed man on earth. Because I can tell you, God can be trusted in every area of your life, including your finances. I can testify that God's math defies explanation and works. I'm saddened and surprised at how many Christians refuse to venture out and trust God. I urge you. Today, 
put God to the test in this area. I wonder how somebody can trust God with their entire eternal destiny and not trust them with money, which is so temporary. How can we trust God for answered prayer but not trust Him for blessings when we give generously to His work, like He's told us to do? I feel sorry for people who live with such a weak, crippled confidence in such an able God. God's math presents a special challenge for some of us. And it's not the ones you might expect. It isn't those who have little in resources who struggle with God's math. It's those who have a lot of God's resources who tend to be the least generous. You see, the greatest challenge is for the affluent. Let me say this to those of you who fall into that category of wealthy. I know nobody here sees themselves as wealthy, but there are people here who have worked hard. They have managed their money very well. They've been very careful. And actually, you are wealthy. And there's nothing wrong with being wealthy. I get tired of people apologizing for being rich. If God blesses you, admit it, enjoy it, and give God the glory. Many of our heroes in the Bible were just filthy rich, and yet we look up to them because they use their wealth rightly. There's a passage in Luke that rich people have to wrestle with. Every one of you who is rich is going to have to figure out what this means to you. Luke 12, 48, Jesus says, From everyone who has been given much, much will be demanded. And from the one who has been entrusted with much, much more will be asked. Jesus is pointing out that wealthy people have greater responsibility. God expects more of them than others. The rich can't just live out their wildest fantasies or hoard it. God wants the wealthy to be strategic with the resources He's entrusted to them. If God has blessed you with an abundance of resources, you should be quick to respond when God lays a need before you. One of the most blessed people in this world might be you. And it would be appropriate to say, Lord, I understand that I am one of a very small percentage of people on the planet that get to manage this much of your wealth. You were the first one I want to thank and honor with the full tithe, and the more resources come my way, the more I want to honor you. My grandpa and Grandma McGilvery lived on a farm in Iowa. They lived in a medium-sized house, but until I was in junior high school, they didn't have indoor plumbing. And I can, help, I can remember helping my uncles to dig the trench through the yard to accommodate indoor plumbing. They thought they were living large before. They had a two-place a two outhouse. I have never figured out why anybody makes a two-place outhouse because I've never met two people that want to go in there at the same time. <laughs> but as inconvenient as it was to use the outhouse, getting water was even worse. Their well was across the road from their house. Now, why anybody dug the well on the other side of the road I'll never know. But I remember helping my grandfather pump water and carry it across the road, across the big front yard, into the house. I thought I had hit manhood when my grandpa asked me one day, Mark, could you go get some water? And I grabbed that bucket and I went over there and I pumped and pumped and pumped and nothing happened. And when I didn't come back for a while, my grandpa came checking on me and immediately he saw the problem. He said, Mark, sometimes you have to prime the pump. And he reached down and he picked up this jar of water that he kept there near the pump for the purpose and he poured it into the pump and he said, pump. And I pumped just a couple of times and out came this cold, deep well Iowa water. And that's when I learned a very important principle. You have to put something in to get something out. God's math for giving what Jesus is talking about in Luke 6.38. Give, 
and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over will be poured into your lap, for with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. We have a God you can trust. If you'd like to trust Him with your most important thing, your life, He'd be glad to be your leader, your forgiver, your provider. If you're already a follower of Christ and you just want to be a part of this church family, we invite you to come. We're going to stand and sing. Come on up.